Hello, welcome back. Um, today I want to kick off what is really one of the more applied parts of the course. So, um, so far we've been studying this sort of theoretical framework for describing nonlinear systems and how we go about investigating nonlinear behaviors. Now we want to sort of put this more in the framework of the types of um, nonlinear, nonlinearities and nonlinear behaviors that you might come up um, against in uh, practice. And the first of these um, is these phenomena that we want to talk about is the, the effects of friction. So how can we model the effect of friction on, say, the, the meshing together of gears or the pulling of um, sort of heavy objects along the ground or the flow of water through um, maybe tight valves or something like that? Um, how can we describe friction or what would simple models of friction look like when put into the language that we've been setting up so far. And um, so that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about simple models for friction and sort of what the effect of friction typically tends to be um, on processes. Um, and this will be an extremely high level and uh, not so deep uh, treatment. Um, the area of modeling friction is actually extremely complicated and quite advanced in general. We're just going to be scratching the surface and uh, getting a feel for some of the simplest models out there. And in the spirit of simplicity, um, today we're just going to be talking about the problem of uh, pulling a mass along the floor, perhaps through some spring like this. So we have a spring here. We apply a force here and we're just dragging the mass and the position of the mass is given by this variable Q. Um, and let's also measure the position of the end of the, the spring with a variable Y. So what happens if we do this? Uh, what sort of friction, um, what, what's the typical sort of friction behavior you come up, uh, come, up, come up against here? Well, I don't know if you've experienced this for yourself, like whenever you're trying to push furniture around, typically you sort of start pushing and then it kind of jumps and then it stops again and jumps. And this is a, a classic um, friction behavior. It's called stiction, this uh, property where you sort of get stuck and then you jump and you get stuck and you jump again. And then I don't know if you push a lot of furniture around, you sort of tend to find that maybe there's this like sweet spot where if you can just keep the velocity at a certain rate, you can sort of push it along and maybe it judders a little bit, but um, uh, you, you, you don't stop and start in the same way that you did before. Um, so if we were to draw all of this into a picture, um, might, uh, what might we get? Well, let's put uh, time here and let's just put what we want to happen on in some color here. So this, this is what we want to happen. So this is, we're pulling the end of this spring just at a constant uh, rate y. And we want to just pull the mass along at a constant um, velocity. Um, but what happens in practice? Well, the mass doesn't um, just follow it doesn't start at q is equal to zero and just kind of ramp up. Uh, what tends to happen is initially nothing happens and then it jumps forward and then you get stuck again and then the spring gets longer and longer and eventually it just jumps and snaps something like this. So you might observe a behavior more like this. Um, and so how do we typically go about modeling this? Well, during these jumps, is this pen working? Oh, I've got so many colors today. So what we're really trying to do is model the effect of these jumps. So the, the friction force is opposing, 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 but is seemingly when the spring gets just long enough and the tension in the spring gets just high enough, it jumps and uh, suddenly we start moving. Um, it shortens the distance, the spring uh, tension drops, and then when it drops below some value again, we get stuck and we sort of slowly build up uh, like this. So this orange curve here, um, this is our position Q. And how do we typically model this effect? Well, we typically model this effect by making um, a, yeah, ma making the friction force velocity dependent. So what does the velocity look like here? Well, we start off stationary and then we get these little jumps and then it becomes stationary again 
then little jumps and little jumps, something like that. And um, we're just going to model the effect of this nonlinear friction-like behavior uh, by adding in a friction force that is velocity dependent. And what's the typical way to do this? Well, if you go ahead and you, you perform some experiment here and you just work out what the friction force must be um, and plot it as a function of the velocity, uh, which is given by this little red curve here. So on this axis, we have the velocity or Q dot. And here we have the friction force, which we can deduce by um, measuring the speeds and the, the forces in this spring. Uh, what do you tend to find out is that the friction force, whenever you're not moving, it's just you're getting a whole bunch of points um, which are just directly opposing the force that you see in the spring. But then when you get far enough, you start to move, you break this stiction, and actually, so when we start moving, the force actually drops off, so we get this um, sort of static friction effect, and then when we start to move, the friction force actually drops off, and then as the velocity gets higher and higher, it tends to kind of ramp up again, something like that, and we get the mirrored situation if we were pulling ourselves in the opposite direction. And it's, it's extremely, and this is a general uh, comment about friction models, it's extremely difficult to get a good model of friction in this zero velocity regime. Um, so really the kind of the value in these measurements really lies away from that region and we get something like that. So if we go and do some experiments, we observe some uh, friction velocity dependent uh, curve like this. And this phenomena in which the friction drops off, uh, this has a special name and it's called the Strybeck effect. And really for the rest of the, the lecture um, and the rest of our treatment of friction, we'll be just sort of considering uh, models for friction that look something like this. So they tend to be uh, velocity dependent. This is far from the end of the story as far as friction models go. Only the simplest models of friction will be uh, representable um, through some static nonlinearity uh, with a kind of a shape, something like this. Um, more advanced models, you get uh, friction effects that are dependent on position and the previous, uh, sort of the history of um, the velocity as well, rather than the velocity at this current point in time. So, if these are the friction forces, how might we uh, put everything together? Um, so, if we were to draw this as a block diagram, what might be going on here? Um, so, the input to our system is this force that we apply here, and this force is mirrored by the, the tension um, in the spring. Um, and this then gets applied to the mass and determines the, um, the, the velocity of the mass like this. So that we've just got a, um, an m q double dot is equal to f in. So these are the forces being applied to the mass and this is the just Newton's law. So what are the input forces? Well, we have the force that we're applying to the end of the spring here or also which is the same as the tension coming through the spring. But we also have the negative force coming from our friction, and um, so opposing the motion. And as we sort of discussed here, it's typical to model this as a velocity-dependent um, force. So a sort of a typical model for friction in this setup would be something like this. And, and here we have our um, friction block. So we have our static nonlinearity modeling friction. And then if we put a one over S in here, we could get the position of the mass. And um, so this is the typical way um, that friction would be built into these kinds of models. And what are the common models of friction that we'll be um, talking about? So common models of friction 
friction. And most of these, the intention is just to try and roughly uh, capture the shape of these curves that you might get from performing the experiment that we described before. So the, the simplest such model, um, you actually just put a relay in. So we say that this friction curve looks something like a relay function, uh, where we sort of have this period um, of uh, stiction, and then um, as soon as you get past a certain point, um, the friction force is just constant. So this is sort of missing a number of ingredients, so we don't have the Strybeck effect, we don't have this drop-off um, in the friction force as we start to move, and we don't have this tendency to increase again. It's all just sort of approximated away into this um, relay function here. So this is one such common model, um, and then there's maybe three more that are worth uh, to mention, um, that are really just trying to sort of slowly build up the feature of these curves in a little bit more detail. Um, so rather than having a pure relay here, sometimes you'll see um, friction modeled more like this. So now we're trying to capture the effect that the force does increase uh, with velocity, rather than just saying that it remains constant. And then these two uh, other models, they try to um, capture this Strybeck effect a little bit. Um, so in this one, you typically have just a, a little, a tiny little step down, and then you go up, and then it's mirrored over here. And then finally, you can get a little bit more sophisticated if you want, and um, you put some curve in that looks like that. But uh, these are sort of common functional shapes that are used to try and roughly capture the effect, um, the, the shape of these Strybeck curves. If you're doing things in practice, there'd be nothing to stop you to go away and try and actually just build up the, the real uh, velocity friction curve for whatever process uh, you had and use that as your friction model instead. Or indeed, go away and build any of these more sophisticated um, friction models. So that's a sort of very brief uh, introduction for how friction is normally built in and how we can start to capture it in the models that uh, we've seen so far. And the key message here is you, you tend to capture it uh, through this sort of feedback force where you have a velocity-dependent friction model that apply, applies um, a, a, a negative feedback input. And in this friction block, we have some kind of static nonlinearity. So these are all ingredients that we've seen before, um, and now we're just going to go and um, try and apply some of the tools that we've seen before to analyze the kinds of behaviors that you would get when you have friction in your models.